Hello, this is Christian Okoye, former Kansas City Chiefs. You are listening to Grilling Truth. Welcome to the NFL Legend Show on the Grueling Crew Sports Network. The NFL Legend Show is brought to you by Replenishing Care Technologies, the future of sports medicine. If you want to find out more about them, go to thegruelingcrew.net, click the banner, it'll take you right there. I am your host for the Legend Show, Mike Goodpaster, and right now I want to welcome in a man who was the defensive rookie of the year in 1984 in the NFL and a two-time Pro Bowler, played for the Kansas City Chiefs and then his final year with the Green Bay Packers. Help me welcome to the Grueling Truth, Bill Moss. How you doing, Bill? What do you say, Mike? Oh, it, pleasure to have you on. I like talking to linemen anyways. They're usually just smarter players. <laughs> well, we tend to think so, especially defensive guys. Well, see, that's when I have the offensive linemen on. They're like, they say the same thing, only they say especially the offensive guys. So it can mm-hmm. go either way yeah. according to who you're talking to. But let's just start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your life growing up, um, some of your early influences when you started playing football. You know, uh, I was always an outdoors kid. I was always spent my time outdoors playing. I couldn't get enough. You know, I my father would be screaming at the front steps, calling for us as the sun was going down, and we were trying to get in our last little bit of, of playtime. And we were, we were always – you know, whatever season it is, you just roll the ball out there and go. So if it was football season, we played football. If it was baseball season, we played baseball. Uh, played a lot of street hockey. You know, I was always always doing something athletic, and um, I enjoy, I just enjoyed competing. You know, playing team sports and being a part of it. And you know, you'd you'd, you'd win some, you'd lose some, but you always show up the next day wanting some more. Um, that's that's just kind of how 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 we grew up. Um, organized sports, as far as that goes, when school started, uh, I actually didn't start playing football, organized football, till uh, the ninth grade, freshman year of, of uh, high school. So I was playing all kinds of other sports, wrestling, baseball, basketball, and I was the biggest kid in the school. And the, the, the football coach was like, are you coming out this year? Are you coming out this year? So uh, and finally, my parents broke down and, and they let me play. And it was a natural fit from day one. I mean, I just it just took to it the second I put the uniform on, everything just fell in place. It was uh, it was just a fun time. Yeah, and you ended up you go to Pitt. What was the decision to go to Pitt like? Because from what I read, you weren't on the best high school team in the country. <laughs> no, <laughs> one nine and one. Uh, yeah, so I was getting recruited, of course, you know by by most everybody in the country letters and coaches would come in and, and, and do all that stuff. And so I kind of just built a criteria. I said, you know, I wanted my family to be able to watch me play. Um, so it was a, it was a total of five hours was the furthest I was going to go away. Um, Syracuse was in that mix. I took a trip up there, uh, Penn state Pittsburgh. Um, at that time, Rutgers and temple weren't, weren't really much of a program. Um, and so when I took the trip to Pittsburgh, it was, they brought in, it was the last weekend of recruiting. It was the weekend the Steelers were in the Super Bowl, and they brought in, it was myself, Herschel Walker, um, Chris Carter, um, a kid, uh, Russell, he played in the pros, I forget who it was, and then Chris Dolman. Anyhow, that's, that's, the, that's the group they brought in that weekend. And my parents just had a great time. The whole atmosphere with the Steelers winning the Super Bowl, it was just, you know, over the bar. And we just had a really good feeling about the city, uh, the, the school, and, and the head coach, Jackie Sherrill. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about Coach Sherrill. Coach Sherrill was a great football coach. What was your relationship like with him? He's unbelievable. He's still in my life to this day. I mean, you know, not a month goes by. I don't hear from him via text message or Facebook or, or something. Um, he stayed in touch with us all the way through our pro careers. He sent us a letter or back then it was a, a telegram um, before the season wishing us the best. Um, 
he was a guy that, you know, he, he's, he made the whole entire difference in my life as far as making me a player. I had the size, I had athletic ability, but there was, there was something that was missing there and, and he found it. He's the one that took me to a different level and, and got it out of me. Um, and I've carried it. It changed my whole life. I mean, everything goes back to, to him. Yeah. So what was the adjustment like coming from a poor high school program to one of the top college football teams in the country? Was the adjustment difficult? You know, I don't remember it being difficult. I just remember, you know, the challenge was there and, and it was, it was on my plate and, and what was I going to do about it? Um, and of course, you know, when you're going against the likes of, NFL Hall of Famers for the offensive line and, and, you know, Russ Grimm, Mark May, Bill Frelick, Jimbo Cover every day in practice, you know, it almost seemed like when it came time to play games, that, that the games were even easier. Um, so what we did on a day-to-day basis was just so intense that uh, when we played the games, it was like, this is easy. Yeah, and also, coaching-wise, they had a great staff there. You had Coach Fazio, who was the defensive coordinator Mm -hmm. there. Um, 1980, your freshman season, I know you had a huge game in the Gator Bowl where you guys basically shell-shocked South Carolina, and was it George Rogers Clark they had in the backfield there? You want to talk a little bit about that game? Because that has to be one of your more memorable ones. Well, yeah, that was that was big. I mean, we've had some, we played in some great bowl games. The Sugar Bowl was a classic too. A couple of years later, but that that year, you know, we were we were eleven and one, and, and we felt we, we were robbed of being in, in a in a major bowl game. We we thought we should be playing, contending for a national championship. We had an all star team, and we had one drop game early in the season down in North Carolina when it was so humid and hot down there. It just took us by surprise, and we came out of there limping. But we went on to win the rest of our, our schedule and, and beat everybody on, on the slate. And we, we felt we, we got shunned uh, by, by, you know, the big bowl games and a national ch- for a national championship bid. And to go to the Gator Bowl and play uh, South Carolina, we, we, were, we were really upset. And we were going to take it out on somebody, and, and we did. Yeah, and I mean, South Carolina had a great team, and I think that game was considered pretty much a toss-up by most people. Um, you get to 1981, and that team starts off the season. You guys blow out Illinois. You blow out Cincinnati. You run through the season. You're sitting at 10-0, and 0, and you go to mm-hmm. you, you play at Pitt Stadium against Penn State. And yeah. that, that's a game, if you win it, you're going to play for a national championship. And things kind of fell apart in that game, but not so much just that game. But talk about the rivalry. I don't think people realize what the rivalry between Pitt and Penn State was back then. Yeah, it was that, you know, that's right up there with, you know, USC and uh, uh, UCLA um, or LSU and or, or Auburn, Alabama. I mean, it was Pitt, Penn State was a marquee uh, game. And at that time, too, the programs were you know, really elite. They were, they were turning out great players every year, and they were always con- in contention for a national championship every year. Um, that game, we, we jumped out 14 nothing, and we thought it was going to be the same old way we do things and uh, just go about our way, but they came battling back, and, and we lost, I think it was 48-14. It was, ended up being a thumping at the end, and that hurt our pride. It really it took something out of it, especially when you play a, a, a rivalry team like that. Um, yeah, they were they were they were pretty proud of themselves that day, and rightfully yeah. so. Yeah, and then eleven and one, you still got a big shot at a big bowl game by playing the Sugar Bowl against Herschel Walker in Georgia, uh-huh. which was a twenty four to twenty win. That has to be another great memory. You want to talk a little bit about that game? Yeah, so you know, Herschel Walker was he was it. I mean, yep, that was uh, college football. He was. Uh, Heisman Trophy candidate, and um, they had a, a stellar team. And uh, Vince Dooley was their head coach. And you heard so much about this this team. And we're going down south here to play them. And we get down to the Sugar Bowl, and and uh, it was a battle. It went back and forth to the end. And then Dan Marino, on the last second, 13 seconds left on the clock, throws a unbelievable pass to John Brown right down the middle. Um, we weren't going for a field goal. We, we were going all or nothing, and uh, he hit the home run there, so to say, 
and uh, we just went crazy on the sidelines. It was just a, such a dramatic, dramatic finish. Yeah, and, and it had to be special to play defense and know that you got a guy like Dan Marino on offense to pick you up. Yeah, you know, uh, we, we, we had some talented, talented defensive players. Um, so many of them were first-round draft choices, went off to the pros. Ricky Jackson, Carlton Williamson, Hugh Green, uh, Chris Dolman, myself, uh, Sal Sinceri, Dave Pizzulli, uh, Greg Meisner. I mean, it was, we just had a, a stacked team defensively. But, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was fun to play defense uh, when you have a quarterback like Dan Marino. I mean, you, you, you just want to get the ball back to him as quick as possible because, you know, something fun is going to happen. All right. Um, and then after the 1981 season, you lose your head coach, and Foz Fazio takes over for Jackie Sherrill. What kind of effect did that have on you personally and for the team? I, I think there was I think there was a lot of people saddened with the decision that, that Coach Sherrill was leaving. Um, you know, he had done so much with that program. He and Johnny Majors really uh, took it to another level. And when he left, uh, a part of that went with him. You know, a lot of the guys were still there, of course, and the talent was still there. Um, but you, you, you know, that's that was a that was a tough move. I, and I think the easiest thing was that Foge taking over. We had a comfort level with him because he had been there all along. So, although there were some people saddened by the move, there was there was no great transition period. I mean, we just went about our business. All right, so we get to 1984, the NFL draft. I, I think it's a little bit different now, being drafted in the NFL, than it was in 1984. You want to talk a little bit to us about your draft day experience? Yeah, you know, it was unique. I mean, there's draft day today is just, you know, it's, it's almost like a Super Bowl. It's, it's so coveted. Um, back then, I mean, they started the draft in, in, at 5.30 in the morning, and um, – I got up and, you know, you turn on the television, you're watching the ESPN and I got a phone call. It was, it was, that's all there was to it. There was no green room or backstage or anything like that. It just, it was, it was a draft. And back then they had, I don't know what they had, like 10, 11 rounds back then. I think um, it was 12, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know there was a lot, but it was, it was, uh, I got the phone call early, and, and uh, I wasn't quite sure where I was going to go. So the fourth pick was, was um, Philadelphia. The sixth pick was San Diego, and they both told me they were going to take me. So if the Eagles had taken me, I would have been home at Philadelphia, which would have been terrific. Or I figured, hey, if San Diego takes me, I'll be at the beach. That will be great, too. But uh, Kansas City was in the middle there, and I had never really heard from them. And they, they, they snatched me at number five. And I remember my father asking me why I'm on the phone. He's got a big atlas out, and he's like, ask him if it's Kansas City, Kansas, or Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> so I, that's what I asked. That was my first question. All right. So were you happy to go to Kansas City, or were you disappointed? You know, I, it, it's just a mentality. It was, you know, I, I figured, look, if I if I get drafted late, I'm going to go to a team that uh, is already winning, and, and they have, so I can help carry on a winning tradition. If I get drafted early, I'm saying, hey, you know, I'm going to try to be a cornerstone and pillar to help turn the program around. And that's that's it was just time to go to work. You know, I, I went to Kansas City and rolled up my sleeves and said, come on, guys, let's go. Let's get something going here. And we did. And two years later, we were in the playoffs for the first time in 15 years. Yeah. And you get there as a defensive lineman, as a rookie, you've got a defensive line coach in Walt Corey, who was a hell of a coach took the bills he was a defensive coordinator for those four straight super bowls and he had a guy like art still there what was that first training camp for you like you know the whole rookie year was kind of just a blur because everything you do is new you know every hotel you go to the training camp every day it's, it's something new you're, you're getting adjusted to it um so that's that was it, it just was a blur, but I remember Art Still and Mike Bell were really uh, two supporting guys that helped me my rookie year. And, you know, they say you're only as good as the people around you. I had two good ones right there. All right. Um, and, of course, owner Lamar Hunt. What were your relationship like with Mr. Hunt? Terrific. I mean, here's a guy that, you know, he will come into the locker room before the game. He'd come into the locker room after the game. He was, he was just such a hands-on uh 
uh, guy as far as, you know, you wouldn't think an owner would, would be that way, but he was, he really cared about the players. He cared about the fans. He cared about people. Uh, just a genuine guy. All right. Then 1986, you guys had a really special season. The Chiefs hadn't been to the playoffs since, I think, 1971. Um, you guys started off the season 3-3. Three and three. Todd Blackledge was the quarterback. Bill Kenny replaced him, and you guys kind of took off from there. You want to talk a little bit about how special that season, and Bill Kenny to me is a guy that had a lot of injury problems, but I think he's really an underrated and kind of forgotten really good quarterback. Yeah, you know, it was, it, it was interesting, uh, th- that whole situation, how – how it played out and the quarterbacks and we didn't know what we were going to do. We thought Todd was the future. Um, but you know, it, it, the head coach at the time, John McAvoy just made a decision. He went with his gut and, and, and let, and let Bill Kenny do his thing. And he, and he did a great job. Um, they, we threw the heck out of the football in that era. Uh, we had a really good defense and we had a tremendous special teams. Uh, that was, that was really a big difference in us. We blocked so many punts. We blocked so many field goals. We won a game in Pittsburgh to get to the playoffs where uh, all three of the touchdowns were on, on special teams. Blocked field goal, went back for one, a kick return, and a punt return. Bill, um, I, I, I remember that game because I was a 16-year-old Cincinnati Bengals fan. And you guys got right? out of the playoffs with that crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something. Yeah, it was, too. I mean, that was – but we, it was, it, that's the beautiful thing about, you know, sports. It's, you know, sometimes it doesn't necessarily mean how you draw things up or how you execute things. If you really want to have a will to win, you'll, you'll find a way to get something done. And that's, that's what we did with that group on, on the special teams. They just took it to another level. Yeah, and then the problem there is, I think, but correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Todd Blackledge have to take over because Kenny got hurt in that game? Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, and, and like I said, it didn't didn't make any difference. It was just next man up. We're going to find a way to win this game. We're going to find a way to get to the playoffs, and uh, and, and they just you know persistence just kept, kept kept at it, and we got something done. Yeah, you guys made it to the playoffs, lost in the first round in the New York Jets. Um, do you think that not having Bill Kenny had a lot to do with that, or were the Jets just better? Yeah, you know, well, a little bit. I mean, yeah. It, Losing Bill definitely hurt, uh, but again, we just thought. And, and and when you go to the playoffs for the first time uh, in a long time, that's that's kind of a new. It's it, it's it's different, you know. It's a, it's a different feeling, and sometimes, you know, you, you know after you lose, okay, we've been here before. We'll be ready next time when, when we get to this stage. Um, but yeah, Bill Kenny not being able to play definitely hurt in that game. But it was still, I think, we only lost by a touchdown, I believe. Um, it was pretty competitive. All right, so John Makovic, after that season, actually got fired. Frank Gans replaced him, who was the special teams coach, I think, at that time. Um, mm-hmm. You want to talk about what that was like? Because everything I've ever heard was the players all wanted Gans, and that's kind of the way it went that way. Is that true? Or yeah, I remember at the time it was. It was just it was it was different. There was something there was something just a miss. Uh, we were missing some kind of key ingredients that uh, I, th- I think John lost the team, even though we went to the playoffs, I think he lost the guys in the locker room. Um, and, and, and Frank was, you know, Frank, if you've ever been around Frank, you know, his personality, it's just electric. Um, and, and the guys were, you know, when, when I told you Lamar Hunt was kind of a hands-on guy, he met with the players, he heard them um, and, and he, and he sided with them. I mean, he made the decision there to, to, to go with, uh, with uh, uh, Frank Gans, and I think a lot of it had to do with, with his meeting with the players. All right, so after that, you guys ended up a couple of years, not the greatest. Um, we go to 1989, Marty Schottenheimer comes in, um, replace Frank Gans. Carl Peterson comes in, and it's the GM, and the Chiefs, almost immediately, you guys become a winning team with an 8-7-1 and one record. What was your relationship like with Marty, and what did Marty do to change the culture of that locker room? Um, the day he got in there, everything changed. Everything. Um, he met with you. 
he was very precise and told everybody what what he needed from them and how we're going to go about doing it and how we're going to win. And he put it right up there on the on the whitewash board. He, he laid it out there for you. This is how we're going to win. And he taught more. Fo- I learned more football from Marty than I and I played all those years. And I never, I never knew how much I didn't know about football. He taught football to everybody. So there was no excuse. Everybody was on the same page. We knew exactly what we had to do and how we're going to go about doing it. Um, you know, we, you have to, on any rundown, you have to hold the ball carriage or under three yards of carry, rule one. Okay. And defensively, we're going to give up 200 max in the air, under 100 on the ground. That's a winning formula. You do that, you'll win. Um, offensively, score more than 18 points. Defensively, keep them under 17 points. And everybody knew exactly what to do. Uh, and, and so there was, when it came time for the game, it almost played out in your head. Like you, you knew exactly how things were going to go according to how things were going on the field. Yeah, and in 1990, after a solid 89 season with the 8-7-1, 1990, you guys made the playoffs, had a 16-3 to lead against the Dolphins, lost the game 17-16, to and then you had 91 where you win a game, then you lost in Buffalo. So when people bring up Marty, they always bring up the fact that he couldn't win in the playoffs. Um, did he coach any differently in the playoffs? I, You know, I don't know. Uh, if if he did or didn't, it didn't seem that way to us. I mean, it, it was just Marty ball. I mean, he's going to line up with two big running backs and he's going to pound the ball at you. And then he's going to do play action pass. But, you know, in, in the playoffs, you know, people are chucking the ball around a little bit more. You know, when you go yeah. up against Jim Kelly, they're throwing the ball downfield. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, that's the one thing he didn't do. He wasn't about throwing the ball around. And it wasn't until later till they convinced him, you know, hey, let's try to get Joe Montana in here and do things a little bit differently. And he did. He listened, you know, because he, he figured he had to change some too. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your time in Kansas. You played with some great players, and a lot of these guys don't get the credit they deserve. Guys like Albert Lewis, Deron Cherry, Kevin Ross, Art Still. And then, of course, you had guys like mm-hmm. Derek Thomas, Christian Okoya. Um, any of these guys just stand out to you as somebody that, you know, we're all close still. I just played golf with the Ron, uh, two days ago. Uh, Christian Coya was in town a week ago or two weeks ago for, he had a little roast. He has a foundation here. Um, art still Mike Bell are still in town. Neil Smith is here. Um, of course we lost a great one, Derek. Um, but yeah, I mean, Albert Lewis, Kevin Ross. I mean, when we see each other, it's, you know, it just picks back up from where it was. It's not as if time has passed. Yeah, and in 1992, injuries kind of became a problem with you. You were with the Packers for a while. Was the transition after retiring difficult for you? Oh, yeah. Anyone that tells you it's not is, is, isn't telling you the truth. Yeah, it's, it's different because at that time, there was, there was, no, there was nothing in place. There was nothing in place to... Uh, help in a transition. I, I, I'm, I was putting on socks and jocks and uniforms every day of my life, and here I'm. I, I leave, and I'm 35 years old. And you know, you're looking around. You're like, okay, now what? Um, luck, fortunately for me, I, I was in the off season. I would do radio, and I would do, work at the television station, and I was really interested in that field. And and uh, I, I took to broadcasting, and I, and I got a job broadcasting and and I I covered the games and you know it was fun I really enjoyed doing all that Um, but there was something that's just not the same like at the end of the day you you do a game you go home you didn't win you didn't lose you you just go home so not having that ability to kind of gauge yourself what you did for all your work winning and losing uh, that's still tough yeah um, and I know you're in the commercial real estate now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had bought you know, while I was playing, bought while I was bought broadcasting and, you know, strip centers or storage units or different things. And, um, so it was a natural fit for me, rental houses, things of that nature. So 
yeah, I've just I've kept my commercial real estate license, and I do that on a day-to-day basis. I, I enjoy it. So what else occupies your time nowadays outside of that? Well, I, I got kids, I got grandkids, and I, I, I enjoy doing stuff. I enjoy traveling. Um, we, we, we go skiing as a family. It's something we enjoy. Um, I, I, I'm still an outdoors guy. I mean, I, I got to be outside hunting and fishing and being outside, and that's, that's my thing. All right. Hey, Bill, it was great having you on the show. Absolute honor. Um, followed your career. Like I said, I was in high school when you were playing in the NFL. I thought you were one of the best defensive tackles in the mid to late 80s and would love to have you back on sometime. Mike, I really appreciate it. Thanks. All right, guys. We're going to go ahead and wrap this up for now. We will be back at 530 with DJ Alexander, currently playing with the Seattle Seahawks. You can check us live there on thegroodlingtruth.net. Uh, reminder, you can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher. Wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Bill Moss, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>